Thanks for having me. One of the uh, privileges of my job is I get to travel and talk to groups of farmers in different parts of the country. And as I was preparing my thoughts for today, I reflected back on a meeting I was part of in 1995 in Great Falls, Montana. And it was a group of ranchers and farmers from the Canadian Prairies and northern Montana, maybe a few people from Wyoming. And there was a fellow who was farming a thousand acres of grain and pulse crops in southern Saskatchewan. And I remember what he said, it really stuck with me. He said, I have weeds, but I'm not afraid of them. And what he meant was not that I have this arrogant attitude of I can dominate any problem, but I understand where I am. I understand what my skill set is. I understand how to adapt to changes that are presented by weather and other circumstances. And I know the weed community that I'm managing well enough that I have confidence that I'll come out in the black every year. And he's been quite successful. He's retired recently. So why did that stick with me? The part that was most important for me was that he had a very clear sense of the system in which he was embedded. The agronomic system, the climate where he worked, but moreover the ecological system. And what I want to share with you today are some thoughts about how ecology can form the basis for better weed management systems. I'm not going to give you prescriptions. I'm not going to tell you do this for this weed. I am going to illustrate my thoughts with a case study on giant ragweed. But what I want to share with you is a way of beginning to develop or expand your thinking based on some ecological principles and processes. So weeds are a recurrent problem for essentially all farms, both conventional and organic. Right now, for conventional farmers, issues with herbicide resistance and off-site movement of herbicides onto non-target plants, into the water, into the air, these issues have become really important, and they're not going to be easy to solve. For organic farmers, you find that despite your best efforts, the weather gets in the way, and you can have incomplete control with cultivation. There are some other things that have made mechanical control more difficult. So I've been looking at the numbers for control efficacy for different types of mechanical practices. Standard one in our area would be several rotary hoeings followed by inter-row cultivations, and that last inter-row cultivation would probably hill up the crop if it were corn and probably soybean. And what you see is that <clears throat> if you average it out across years, wet years and dry years, years where it's well set up for you to cultivate in a timely fashion in those years where you just can't get there when you want to, that the control efficacy is nowhere near 100%. In some studies, it runs above 90. Some studies, it's down to the high 60s. And there's a lot of variation. But the point is, it's very difficult to get anywhere close to the efficacy that conventional herbicides can produce. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. I'm not saying that excellent operators can't do well, because they do. And there are improvements in machinery, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, that increase that efficacy. But what I want you to stick with is this idea that it's very common to come up quite a bit shy of 100% control. In cereals, uh, the literature is uh, also not that promising. If you're working with a pre-emergence and a post-emergence tine harrowing and crops like spring wheat or barley, the literature would indicate that you're killing about 40% of the weed seedlings. You're damaging some of the others, so perhaps they don't grow as well. But by no means are you going to eliminate that whole weed population growing beneath your small grain canopy. So people are paying attention to these kinds of uh, shortcomings with mechanical cultivation. And there are 
some very promising things coming on board. So uh, this is a small unit that I've seen in Switzerland called a steerage hoe. And it is, as you get in the name, somebody sitting on the back and steering it. And this is a carrot crop. And you can see that that person can shift the uh, implement right or left so that it uh, doesn't hurt the crops in rows, but uh, works very close to the row. And you can get uh, increased efficacy of weed control when you use one of these machines. This is a uh, steerage hoe applied to grain put in 10 inch rows. And there are people who are beginning to use this 10 to 12 inch rows. And uh, the combination of a tine harrow and in a row cultivation, in this case, uh, with somebody sitting on the back, we'll look at a more sophisticated machine in a moment, can uh, bring up the control efficacy to above 60%. And as we know, grain, small grains like wheat and barley can be extremely competitive. So that may be sufficient to get the job done. Here's a uh, Swedish built machine. It costs on the order of 70 to 90,000 dollars. It uses uh, RTK positioning systems and a camera-based computer-assisted lateral shift to cultivate between 10-inch rows. It can also fertilize. It can interseed um, clover and other green manure crops in between the rows. And it can plant. So you can get multiple operations out of this machine. But uh, the point is that we now have, coming online, if not already, sophisticated, computer-driven cultivation equipment that can allow crops to be planted in relatively narrow competitive rows, and you can still get a cultivator between them. So this machine, the standard model, runs about 25 feet wide, and they can go up to 40 feet. All right, so <clears throat> I'm a strong believer in the value of cultivation. But I think that if you're looking for more durable improvements in weed management, you also have to consider the ecology of the system that you're working in. So we're going to talk most of the rest of the session today about principles and processes in ecology that drive weed management. A starting point is going to be appreciating what I'm going to call the life history characteristics of the weeds that are particularly problematic on your farm. And when we're talking about life history characteristics, we're talking about things like how long do the seeds live in the soil? From what depths can they emerge? How many seeds are made on a plant that reaches reproductive adulthood? And then what's the fate of those seeds once they're dropped off the parent plant? So those are the kinds of things that ecologists track and that have direct bearing on the population dynamics of weeds in your fields. And then with that kind of information, what I want to advocate is compare your weed management options. And I'm going to use a lot of analogies from business because I'm involved in a $7 million business. Our food co-op in town uses many of the same accounting techniques that I'm going to share with you today for weeds. And if you build a pro forma to look at how your business is going to generate revenue and have costs in the future, that's what you're doing when you compare weed management plans. So the fancy word for this is weed population dynamics. That means it's not a static thing. It changes over time. These are dynamical processes. And as an ecologist, I recognize something called the fundamental populations dynamics equation. Okay, And I'll walk you through it. And it's just like doing your bank balance. Okay, What you have a year from now is a function of what's in your account now, what you put into it, and what you take out of it. What are your credits, what are your debits, and what's your starting balance? And that's going to give you the next balance. So if you look at a seed bank of weeds in the soil, you look at the number of seeds in the soil volume in a given land area, you look at how many are added through births or new seeds being shed on the soil. You look at how many are removed by deaths, and we'll talk about the various ways that seeds die. And then you can have immigrants and emigrants. So immigrants are things that blow in, or things that are carried in in manure and get spread into your field. Emigrants are things like these seed harvesting 
uh, seed destructors now, where you can separate not just the crop seed from the chaff, but you can actually separate weed seeds from crop seeds and then you can grind those up. And those are being used commercially in Australia and they're being tested now in Illinois. So this is just basically an input output model where we look at what's there now, we see what we add and we see what we take away. And that gives us what we're gonna have in the future. And if we do that over time, we begin to appreciate, is my problem getting worse? Is my weed infestation getting denser? or is it going lower? And we want to be headed in the direction of every year a little bit lower. Okay, so here you see the life history diagram for weeds. You start out with seeds in the soil, those germinate. We call that process in ecology recruitment from the seed bank into the seedling population. You try to kill those seedlings in a variety of ways. Mechanically, if you're a chemical farmer, you'll spray herbicides. If those seedlings survive to reproductive adulthood, they produce seeds. And those seeds are shed onto the soil surface and they may be attacked by a variety of organisms like mice and insects and birds. And if they make it back into the seed bank, they can live there for up to several years, some cases many, many, many decades. So this is kind of the, the model of how an annual weed survives in a field over time. Right? It's got to go through this annual life cycle. It has the opportunity to park itself in the soil bank for a given number of years, and that'll differ among species depending on their biology. Okay, so let's take a closer look at some of those processes. We have seeds in the soil that go in by being shed from the parent plant, and either they work their way in through the freeze-thaw action of the soil and into cracks where they're deeper in the soil, or they lie on the soil surface. They can be preyed upon by organisms we call seed predators. And these are mice, insects, birds, calemlins are not really important, but pill bugs are. There are a whole variety of organisms that are out there that we're just beginning to appreciate that use seeds as little packets of energy and nutrients. And they feed. And as I'll show you in a little while, fairly large quantities of the seeds can be removed. This seed removal is not sufficient to give you 100% effective weed control, but it's a very important part of biologically, ecologically, organically oriented weed management. And if you remove it, which we've done artificially, the population dynamics of the weeds shift to big increases. So this is like a break on the rate of population increase. And we want to encourage seed predation and destruction by organisms that eat weed seeds. Seeds in the soil can die because they're attacked by a variety of pathogens. They can die just because they're too old, basically senescence in the way an organism reaches the end of its lifespan and dies. Or you can have what's called fatal germination. The seed germinates at an inappropriate place or time and that doesn't turn into a seedling because it's too deep in the soil profile or it comes up at a time where it's killed by you preparing the seed bed. So those are ways that you deduct seeds from the weed seed bank, right? And those are debits from that account. The yellow arrow represents things that go into the account, inputs. Okay, and then as I mentioned before, you can have seed dormancy and persistence, and this is an adaptive characteristic of weeds. If they all germinated at the same time, you would just wait until they all came up and then you'd kill them all. And what they've done is they've spread out their germination patterns so that in any given year, something like five to 25% of the seed bank will emerge and the rest of it will hang out there waiting for other times to come up and infest your crops. So part of the things that we try to do are trick the weeds to come up at the wrong time by stirring the soil through false seed beds and other types of practices. Seedling emergence is a way to get seeds out of the soil. And like I said, if you can force the seeds to emerge as seedlings and then kill those seeds, seedlings before your crop is planted, you have reduced the soil seed bank. Okay, so that's sort of the general pattern. And now we're gonna look at a case study. How many of you have dealt with this weed? Okay, so it's an interesting story from an evolutionary biology point of view, and it's a uh, big story from the standpoint of weed management. So this is from uh, central Illinois. 
And you can see that uh, when they say giant ragweed, they mean giant, and it has the ability to overtop many crops. I've seen it above corn, and it's highly competitive, okay? It does have, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, some um, Achilles heels that render it vulnerable to certain types of control practices. But it is an extremely competitive weed for reasons that we'll talk about in a moment. This is a survey of certified crop advisors, almost all conventional, across the Corn Belt. And the darker red color indicates where it is the most difficult weed that farmers are experiencing. And what I want you to see there is there's kind of a band that runs from western Ohio through central Indiana through northern Illinois up into southern Wisconsin and a bit of Minnesota. Now it's moving into eastern Iowa, but farther west in the Corn Belt, like Nebraska, it's less of a problem. And we'll talk about why that is in just a moment, but basically this species is adapting and it's moving populations that are more problematic from the eastern side of the Corn Belt to the western side. Okay, so what are some of the key characteristics of this weed that contributes to its success? So I mentioned that farmer from Saskatchewan. He knew where he was. He knew the weeds he was dealing with, and he understood enough of their characteristics that he could appreciate where they posed threats to him and where he had the upper hand. So now we're going to look at some of the things that make this weed problematic. It has large seeds with substantial energy reserves. This means it can push up from three to four inches de depth in the soil through that topsoil where many of our smaller seeded weeds like water hemp typically germinate in the top three quarter inches or less of the soil. So large seeds mean you can push up from deeper soil depths and it has a lot of reserves with which to supply early growing seedlings. So when you see a seedling come up, it has large cotyledons, they're photosynthetic. It starts pumping in carbohydrate into the young seedling and almost immediately this plant is up and running and you get rapid leaf production and growth. You get a big canopy made quickly, virtually all above ground portions of the plant, including the stem and the leaf petioles are photosynthetic. The reproductive structures are photosynthetic, and this plant is priming itself with energy. And in a small grain crop in an organic setting, you can find that it very quickly overtops the crops. And then you're done. OK? It won. Unless you get one of these comb cut machines and you think it's really good, you probably don't have a lot of options at this point, because the population is too dense in many places to walk the field effectively, or you may disrupt the small grain crop, or it's not worth it to you anyway. All right, so this contributes to a suite of characteristics that make this plant extremely competitive. The uh, original populations of this plant emerged very early. So this is a timeline from uh, late March, early April on the left side over to the end of June on the right side. And you see a bunch of different species. And those ovals correspond to kind of peak periods of emergence. And that red circle for giant ragweed shows that it with kochia are two of the early emerging weeds originally. And then <clears throat> most of their emergence was concentrated in the early spring, mid to late April. Why is that important? If most of those seedlings came up in late April, what could you do before you planted your corn crop? You'd get rid of them, right? Some kind of seedbed preparation technique that would kill all the emerged seedlings, and you could dramatically reduce the population of giant ragweed that was going to come into your corn crop. Now, you have to be aggressive because these seedlings are large enough and the root systems are robust enough that even burying these without killing the seedlings very effectively can basically just set them back for a few days and then they can grow back into the corn. So you have to be on top of the situation. But when you're looking at a weed that largely emerges before your crop is planted, you do have the opportunity to reduce the pool of seedlings that's going to infest your crop. So that was the case, but it's no longer the case. 
where this weed is becoming more problematic. What you see on the top and the bottom graph are these early emerging population characteristics where most of the weed population is emerging in April. So if you looked on hedgerows in Iowa, field borders in Iowa, you would see a lot of ragweed that had continued to survive because farmers weren't killing it directly. The ones in the field that emerged like on that top graph were even, they're being killed mechanically before the crop was planted or were being sprayed with a burn down application and killed them. So most of the ragweed that I met in Iowa when I first arrived 20 years ago had been on the field borders. Okay, the central graph is what you got on the eastern Corn Belt that's now moving west. And it's definitely in eastern Iowa, it's definitely in southern Wisconsin, and it's definitely in southern Minnesota. That is an extended period of emergence, which means these large seeded weeds can push up in crops like corn and soybean, and because they have rapid growth rates and can begin to overtop your crops, they're highly competitive, and you can't eliminate them before you plant your crop. So that's the pattern that's becoming more common. And if you look at the distribution of the emergence period of giant ragweed in months, the red and the hot colors represent this extended emergence from April through the middle of the summer versus the yellow further west in a few other places represents this period of emergence where it's very concentrated in about a month. And what you see is that the same area from the western side of Ohio across southern Minnesota is where we have this extended period of emergence is where this weed is becoming more problematic. From a conventional management point of view, it's also creating a lot of problems because it has resistance to glyphosate, essentially all of the ALS inhibiting herbicides, and those resistances are being stacked. So it's not only highly competitive, but it's resisting most of the dominant herbicides. But we're not going to get into that now. It does mean that your conventional farming neighbors are getting well acquainted with this weed in many places. Okay, so these extended periods of seedling emergence make giant ragweed control considerably more difficult. But, as I mentioned before, this species has several vulnerabilities. These characteristics will not be the same for other weeds. Okay, so if you have a water hemp problem, how you develop a management strategy for water hemp will be different based on its biological, ecological characteristics. If you have problems with perennial weeds like Canada thistle or quackgrass, you have to think about those differently. So what I'm trying to do here is illustrate an approach rather than write you a prescription for every weed on your farm. Okay, but I think you begin to see how we integrate information and build strategies accordingly. So I'll talk about three of these vulnerabilities today. One is that it has really high rates of seed consumption by rodents, insects, uh, pill bugs, birds, things that eat weed seeds as energy and nutrient packets. It has a relatively transient seed bank in the soil. These seeds don't last more than several years. So if you can keep this weed from shedding new seeds in your field, the death of seeds in the soil will mean that the problem will diminish dramatically over a period of about four or five years. The other characteristic of this weed, unlike very prolific species like water hemp, and Palmer amaranth, which can set hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant. This species typically sows one or two thousand when it's growing well. They're big seeds, but they're not numerous. Okay, so in Iowa, where I work, these are the dominant creatures that eat weed seeds. The prairie deer mouse, which is indigenous, and we find very high numbers in crop fields. In September, we can trap 17 or 18 adults per acre, right? And they're feeding to build up their reserves for the winter. They don't hibernate. They have to find seeds over the winter, too. They will eat crop seeds if there's a lot of waste grain shed by the combine, but most farmers aren't doing that. So they're consuming energy and nutrients in the form of seeds that are being shed 
late in the summer when these weeds are maturing. Crickets are growing throughout the season and they're typically big enough by late August or September that their mouth parts can uh, consume fairly large numbers of weed seeds. So here's an experiment that was done in uh, Ohio where they put weed seeds on the soil surface. These are giant ragweed. And they looked at the consumption of these seeds from November, when they placed the seeds on the ground, to the following year in the fall. And what you see is over winter, from fall to spring, about 60% of these seeds were removed by predators. And if they let them sit there on the soil surface for the full year, 88% of them were removed. Okay, so that's nature doing its job. It's saying that no food goes to waste and the organisms that are adapted to consume seeds will do it if these seeds are in a place where olfactory smell cues and visual cues can be used to allow insects and mice and birds to locate these seeds. So keeping the seeds on the soil surface as long as possible contributes to more seed consumption by predators. Okay, another thing that these folks saw when they buried seeds at different depths from the soil surface down to 10 inches, 20 centimeters, is that virtually none of these seeds survived more than four years. So emerged is in that striped gray bar, which you see most of them coming up from the top 10 centimeters or four inches on the left side of those graphs, season one, season two, almost all of them come up in the first two years. <clears throat> and those black bars, which are the viable remaining seeds that didn't get consumed and didn't rot and didn't emerge, the black ones are the ones that continue to live in your seed bank. And notice that more of them die close to the soil surface because of more biological activity than when they're buried down eight inches. So the black bars on the bottom of each one of those graphs are bigger than the black bars on the top after the first season. So about 90% of the seeds buried in the top four inches of soil were eliminated after two years. Okay, so if you can prevent new seeds from going in, you can see a fairly rapid reduction in the infestation of the soil seed bank. Okay, I mentioned before that this weed is not particularly prolific. And if you look on the right side of that graph, this is from a field in Minnesota where they looked at um, what was being produced on the margin on the left side and in the soybean crop on the right side. Within the soybean, about 1,400 viable hard seeds were being produced on a single giant ragweed plant surviving in that soybean crop. So, like I said, if you're dealing with water hemp, you're talking tens or hundreds of thousands of seeds on a large, mature adult plant. But that's not true for giant ragweed. The seeds are big, they're well equipped to grow quickly as seedlings and overtop your crop, but they're not vast numbers being produced. The other thing about the seeds is they hang on to the plants until late in the season. And this is gonna be important when we talk about control strategies. So <clears throat> when you look at the date of seed shed off of mature plants, we're starting on the 20th of September on the left side of that graph, going out into November on the right side of that graph. And when you're looking at the number of seeds shed, essentially none of them have been shed in late September, and a relatively small proportion have been shed in early October. Okay, so most of these seeds are gonna stay on the plants until the fall. And that's gonna be important for another control strategy when we talk about using winter cereals, because winter cereals are harvested in the summer, and the seeds of giant ragweed are not mature during the middle of the summer, by and large. You with me so far? Okay, so now we're gonna look at a scary situation. So this is a map, we call it a heat map, of about a one acre field in southern Minnesota. All right, so the red portions of that map represent between 87 and 115 
seeds per square meter. Okay, a square meter is about a yard square. The green portions are four to 18 viable seeds per square meter. Okay, and you notice that there's a fairly large area of that field that's in the yellow to pink to red area category, right? So that means you have a fairly significant infestation in portions of that field. And if you want to translate what 100 seeds per square meter means, if you build that out to an acre, that's about 405,000 viable seeds per acre in the top four inches of soil from which those seeds can emerge. So that's a big number. And it's hard to beat the numbers. So I'll just take you through kind of a back of the envelope calculation. If you start out with 100 seeds per square meter in the soil, that's about 405,000 seeds per acre. Okay, let's be generous and say 30% of those seeds are going to germinate and emerge. So that gives you 121,000 seeds per, or 121,000 seedlings per acre that just came up in your crop if it has this extended emergence period, right? Okay, so let's be, I'll say realistic, you're good at cultivation, but we're being respectful of the numbers that say 100% efficacy is pretty hard to get. So we're gonna say 90% control with your cultivator, with your whole slew of cultivating equipment, the rotary hub, inter-row cultivator, whatever you're using. Okay, so that brings our population down to only 12,000 plants per acre. But each one of those 12,000 plants is gonna produce 1,400 seeds. So we've now got 17 million seeds that are about to drop onto that field. Okay, so let's assume 60% seed loss to predators by the next spring when you wanna work that field to produce another crop. You only have 6.8 million new seeds added to the seed bank ready to go in your crop. Hard to beat the numbers, okay? And I have farmer friends who have been organic. They were seriously challenged by giant ragweed and they're getting out of organics in some fields because they cannot manage this weed organically in the rotation system and with the equipment they're working with, all right? And I'll tell you about one of my friends and colleagues who's making some changes on his farm based on this weed being his absolute worst problem, and it didn't used to be. Okay, so what can we do in terms of cropping systems and weed management? And I'm gonna give you this as an example of thinking rather than a prescription. So imagine that we can break crops into two categories. Row crops that you can cultivate. If you're a chemical farmer, you can spray them or you can hand weed them. But we recognize that weed control can be less than 100% effective. Then we have solid seeded crops that are harvested in midsummer or that are mowed in the case of perennial hay crops and removed for fodder. And in these crops, seed production by this weed, if you do these kind of mowing and harvesting operations in a timely manner, you can effectively shut down the reproduction of giant ragweed if you harvest at the right time of year. And that relates to what I showed you before, that the seeds hang on to the parent plant maturing until September and October. And if you interrupt that life cycle by repeated mowing of hay or take off a winter grain in midsummer, you can disrupt the life cycle of this weed. So here are the kinds of things that people are doing. You use a no-till drill and you put a winter cereal like triticale or rye into the residue of a fall harvested crop like soybean. And you leave as much of that residue and as many weed seeds on the soil surface as possible because you want the predators to do their job. If you have that field totally infested with perennial weeds, you're probably not gonna do that. But assuming that you're relatively clean going into a winter grain, you can uh, no-till it. Some people 
are tilling it, getting rid of the weeds before they plant their winter cereal. Okay, so this is what uh, winter triticale looks like in April in Boone County where I work, central Iowa. And you see a highly competitive canopy already ready to go. And uh, it's difficult for weeds to emerge and compete effectively with a winter cereal crop that's already well fed, well established and growing effectively when sunshine is abundant. Then we get to the point where the crop matures and uh, we're ready to cut it in July. And you either swathe it or you direct cut it. But <clears throat> at this time, all those summer annual weeds have not had enough chance to reproduce effectively. In the stubble, potentially, they can make a go of it. So we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But because of that early jump, the winter cereals like triticale and rye, and if you're in the wheat zone, have, you can get a tremendous head start on early germinating weeds like giant ragweed. If you're in a forage situation, very difficult for a weed like giant ragweed to make seeds because it's being nipped off three to five times a season by your hay operation. So from the standpoint of preventing reproduction and uh, basically staunching the flow of new seeds into the seed bank at a time when you're allowing seed predators and pathogens and inappropriate germination in the soil to take place, that seed bank is being depleted. Not entirely, but if you have several years of hay, you're gonna draw down the seed bank of giant ragweed substantially. Okay, so <clears throat> these kinds of insights begin to dictate some questions like, how effective does control need to be to prevent infestations of this and other weeds from getting worse, right? Because these are dynamic situations. They change over time. Rarely do they stay the same from year to year. They're either gonna get worse or they're gonna get better depending on weather and your management. Is the length of a crop sequence within a rotation important for control of giant ragweed in particular? Is the sequence of crops within a given rotation sequence important? And then, if you are going to walk the fields, does that contribute to better weed management over time? Is it worth your investment paying people or yourself to go walk and rogue out any surviving giant ragweed? Okay, so we're going to evaluate some different options in two ways. We're going to look at the seed population density in soil over time. That's our bank account. Are we accruing or losing seeds in that seed bank? And we can also look at weed plant density. Okay, so I'm a, an agronomist, I'm a biologist, and I use models because they allow me to do investigations of a lot of what-if scenarios that I can't afford to do a 10-year experiment that includes all possible treatments in the field. Okay, so I gather numbers from the field and from the scientific literature, and then I use this kind of a diagram that is informed by the survival of weed seeds in the soil seed bank, emergence of seedlings, the survival of seedlings in response to cultivation of herbicides, and then the seed production and seed survival from adult plants. Okay, and I run this in a population dynamics model program that I build myself, it's in a modeling platform called Stella. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But as I mentioned before, if you plan a business and you build a pro forma about what your revenue and expenses are going to be over the coming years to get an idea of where you're vulnerable and where you're likely to start making money that you can hold on to, you understand how to do this because the principles are exactly the same. Okay, so don't get hung up by the idea that it's a model. You know how to do this if you're running a business. Okay, so I'm gonna look at some different scenarios here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is evaluate for a three-year rotation of two solid, or one solid seeded crop followed by two row crops, how good ragweed control has to be. 
In other words, how many ragweed individuals do I need to control in the row crops so that the population goes down over time? And I'm going to start out with 90% control, and I'm going to work my way up to 95% control. And what you see here is in a three-year rotation of a solid seeded crop, followed by two row crops like corn and soybean, if I'm up to 95% control, the population density of giant ragweed plants is continuing to go up over that 12-year period. Those bars are going up and not down. Okay, so 95% control in this computer simulation of a three-year rotation of a solid seeded crop followed by two row crops wasn't good enough. Okay, so I can keep building that model with different values of control efficacy. And as it turns out, if I can get above 96.3% control in my row crops, given this model and all the things that are assumed in it, the seed bank and the number of adult plants that I find in my row crops goes down. So in this case, for a three-year rotation, I've got to have 96.3% control efficacy. That means you know, I can have less than three out of 100 giant ragweed plants that come up survive. Okay, And if you multiply that out to an acre figure, you get some idea. OK, is the length of a crop sequence important? So here, I'm going to compare, using the same model, a four-year rotation against a three-year rotation, I'm going to put my solid seeded crops, either my alfalfa or other hay or my winter cereals, in the front end of the rotation, and I'm going to follow it with row crops like corn and soybean on the back end. So how good does the control efficacy in the row crops have to be to prevent that population of giant ragweed from increasing? over time. If I'm in a three-year rotation, I'm looking at the need to be above 96.3% control efficacy in the row crops. If I go to the four-year rotation where I've got two years of that solid seeded crop where essentially no giant ragweed seeds are going in and they're dying in the soil, I can get down to a requirement for 90% control efficacy in the row crops. So just by having more solid seeded crops in the front of the rotation, extending that rotation to four years, I can lower the requirements for control in my row crops and keep the population from expanding. What happens if I start with solid seeded crops versus starting with row crops? So here, I'm going to compare a four-year rotation where I've got two years of hay or two years of winter cereals followed by my row crops versus the mirror image of two years of row crops versus the solid seeded crops. What you see is that, like we saw before, a four-year rotation with two years of solid seeded crops up front as a requirement for 90% control efficacy in the row crops. But if you go into the row crops first, you have a control efficacy requirement of close to 98%. So those crops with which you start your control strategy ultimately control whether or not you're going to be successful using lower and lower levels of cultivation control efficacy. You follow that so far? Suppress a short-lived weed species first to reduce the number of seeds in the soil, which will then allow you to not have to be as good in controlling it in your row crops. Finally, I want to ask the question, is it worth walking fields to rogue out the surviving giant ragweeds? And the simple answer is it definitely is if you're working within a rotation scheme that is contributing to the suppression of this weed. So if you cultivate only and you're working with a solid seeded crop followed by row crops and you don't use any hand weeding, the control efficacy has to be 90%. But if you only have 80% efficacy, which might be realistic, right? you can prevent the population of giant ragweed with a control efficacy of 80% in your row crops if you're willing to take out 51% of the survivors after that by walking the field. That means you can leave roughly half the giant ragweed in the field, but you got to get 
about half of them out by hand. If you take them all out, that's even better, right? But the point is that you can match hand roguing with control through inner row cultivation and other means like rotary hoeing to allow you to develop a multifaceted, highly effective giant ragweed suppression approach and prevent this weed from getting worse from year to year. So you follow me so far? All right, so we're gonna shift back out of the world of models to the real world. Some of you know Tom Franson, who farms in uh, north central Iowa. Giant ragweed was the absolute worst weed on his farm. Didn't used to be. It is now. It was uh, devastating his small grain crops that were planted in the spring, like oats. He was just chopping those off before uh, they just turned into a disaster because giant ragweed grew through them. He was spending a lot of time trying to control it in corn and soybean. It was not working well. So now he's growing winter cereals like hybrid rye. And you can see the pressure of giant ragweed in front of him. And that same pressure is in the field behind him, but those giant ragweeds are not making it above the canopy. Um, you can find a YouTube video of Tom parting back the cereal. And you find little giant ragweeds that are really not gonna make it to reproductive maturity and basically prevented from adding any new seeds. He's gonna follow this with a uh, forage seeding. He'll keep that forage for several years and then he'll go back to row crops. And he has uh, livestock on the farm. He uses the straw from this cereal crop as bedding. He feeds the hybrid rye now in uh, his swine rations. All right, so this is his approach to matching solid seeded or fall seeded cereals with his row crops to begin to get a handle on this weed that has really, really challenged his farming. And um, he thinks he's made some real progress. All right, so some points to remember and then there's a quiz. Um, certain crops and management activities can minimize weed seed inputs. In the case of giant ragweed, using winter cereals and using hay crops effectively shuts down most of the reproductive seed output of this plant and uh, stops inputs into your seed bank. Starting new rotation sequences with weed suppressive crops like hay and winter cereals, in the case of giant ragweed, is really important. Weed emergence without subsequent reproduction depletes the seed bank. This is what we are trying to do and leaving weed seeds on the soil surface for as long as possible. Delaying tillage increases losses to seed predators. All right, so now we're gonna look at a, uh, another real world situation. And this is like a test to kind of stir your thinking. Maybe we have time for some questions. So um, I think some of you are acquainted with the Thompson family. Dick Thompson started Practical Farmers of Iowa in 1985, I believe. He also was an, an astute observer of weeds, and he was good with machinery. He liked to weld, and he liked to uh, adjust machinery so that he could get the maximum amount of control for each pass that he uh, ran through the field. So what I'm trying to say is he's one of the best farmers I've ever met. And yet, when you go out and look at what's actually going on in this field, like this set of measurements done by Doug Bueller and Keith Kohler in the 90s, what do you see? So he's got common water hemp and foxtail, which are very prevalent in our area. Other species that include things like lamb's quarters and velvet leaf. And you see that in his corn and soybean, he did a remarkably good job of control. So he would typically rotary hoe pre-emergence, rotary hoe post-emergence, and he was a ridge till guy. And in his corn and soybean, he uh, would move soil away from the ridge on the first pass and then build a strong ridge on the second pass. And he had very, very effective control on corn and soybean. And yet, he had weeds in his oat stubble, <laughs> 
and he had some weeds in his hay. So basically what was going on is he kept maintaining that weed population. So you might think about, well, what would he have done differently if he got this big burst of weeds in oats and a certain amount of reproduction of things like water hemp and foxtail and his subsequent hay crops? And you can see that even more clearly in the uh, seed bank numbers here. So notice that <clears throat> coming out of hay, the seed bank drops after corn because he's allowed some of those seeds to die, right? And he's done a really good job cultivating in corn, and he's prevented any new seeds or very few seeds from going back in. And then he does that in his next corn and soybean crops. So in his case, his control efficacy in his row crops for these summer annual weeds like water hemp and foxtail was outstanding. And he could deplete his seed bank in his row crop phase for these particular weed species. And then he would go back into oats and you know he didn't do much other than clip the stubble maybe once and he gets this huge burst of weed seeds coming out of his oat stubble. And then those contribute to an infestation of his hay crops and hay is effective, but it's not totally effective for preventing more weed seeds from being shed. And then he goes back to corn, soy, corn. Okay, So this is different from the pattern I showed you before. There are different species involved, but it gives you an idea that you've got to look and figure out where within your rotation sequence, given the spectra of weeds that you're confronting, are seeds being shed, and where are you preventing reproduction and depleting the seed bank? Right? So there's no one answer, but when we begin to get this kind of information about where are the weeds emerging, where are they surviving, where are they making seeds, what's the fate of those seeds, then we can begin to build effective rotation sequences and match our control practices to the biology and ecology of the weeds that we're confronted. And that's when I think you hear farmers say, I have weeds, but I'm not afraid of them. Thank you for your attention. That's it. <laughs> Do we have the lights? Do we have the lights? I want to answer some questions. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I have a question about, um, so what is the difference between 96% control and 90% control? Because we don't count on these. So what does it look like? What's that? What does it look like? Yeah, I mean, so how do you, how do you, how can you keep track of that? <clears throat> the question is, how can you tell if you have 96 versus 90% control? All right, so the first thing I'm going to say is these numbers are not magic. Don't take them home and expect that this is your marker because they're specific to the way I set up this model, which had a specific number of weed seeds in the seed bank and assumptions about how many seeds are shed, right? So if you want to know how effective you are in controlling your weeds, you just want to get an idea, right? Mark an area of your field, count it before you cultivate, and count it after you cultivate. And you'll get an idea of how many of those weeds that were there before you ran your cultivator through survived three days later, OK? Or you can mark an area from this time that the weeds emerge with your crop to when you do your last cultivation and figure out what of the initial emerged populations of seedlings has continued. So if you're one of those people who measures residue cover by putting a chain down or a meter tape down and you measure every yard, every meter, whatever, the intersection of residue versus bare ground to see how much residue cover you have, you can do the same thing with weeds, right? You stretch out a tape, you count every weed along that tape, or you figure out where it intersects weeds. You put it back in the same two places, stretch the tape, and see what's there. So basically, you're trying to see before and after how many of them went away. All right? But don't use that 96% or 90% as your marker, because you might need more control than that, or you might need less, depending on the circumstances. Yeah. I had a customer that had a ragweed problem, 
And I thought it was probably from planting in dry soils and the weeds and the crops got up at the same time, or was it a situation that he didn't do enough uh, cultivation before he planted? So the question was related to a giant ragweed problem? Right. And uh, whether or not it was uh, if soil moisture? What I was saying is, uh, if, was it a situation that you should have waited for more rain to get the crops up before the weeds emerged? Or uh, if you plant dry dirt, will that make any difference with weeds coming up the same time as, as crop seeds? Okay, so if you waited, would you kill more of them? Does weather affect the emergence right. pattern? Okay, where do you farm? Uh, Illinois, Central Illinois. Okay, so you probably are encountering an extended period of emergence with giant ragweed. You're in that zone where it went from being weed you could effectively eliminate because it all came up early on to being emerging in your crop now. So <clears throat> what you want is a certain flush of weeds before your crop emerges. Sometimes you can enhance that by stirring the soil. You get a uh, emergence in response to soil disturbance, and then you have to come back and kill them again. But I would, I would uh, bet that if you're in that area where you're seeing extended emergence, um, a sizable proportion of what is going to come up may come up after you fit the seed bed and plant your crop. Yes? Um, <clears throat> several years ago, I, I met a fellow here at Madison that was a part of a company called Blue River Technology. And they were developing uh, AI units that uh, have recognition software, and uh, they had some success with thinning lettuce, but they're wanting to apply it to organic weed elimination. Have you, uh, are you familiar with this equipment? Yeah, yeah. so the, 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 the question or the comment relates to, can you use artificial intelligence sensing real-time um, image detection systems to figure out where the weeds are precisely within the field and then do things to them. And this uh, is being used for uh, real-time sensing in chemical weed control where you turn on herbicide booms uh, only in those areas of the field where you have particular weeds and they actually can get to the point where they can tell grass weeds from broadleaf weeds and they can apply in real-time broadleaf and grass herbicides only on those places where you have one type or the other type or both types. There are people who are interested in using grit in killing weeds by firing it out <clears throat> parallel to the soil surface um, from little emitters um, in a kind of real-time sensing situation for organics. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, you know, typically the Herbicidal materials you might apply in an organic system are expensive, so perhaps it's desirable to only put them on where you sense the weeds. But those types of uh, sensing units and dispersion units are coming online, but um, they're not going to be cheap. So, you know, if you're thinking about ways that you can increase cultivation efficacy. You might think about one of these steerage hoes. You might think about um, working with RTK systems if you can afford those so you can work closer to crop rows. But, you know, the, the, if you take a cold, hard, cynical look at the cultivation literature, what you see is that sometimes it works very well and often it doesn't work anywhere close to 100%. So what I'm hoping you take away from this session today is not that cultivation is a bad thing. You need to do it well. And you need to know your machinery well. And you need to be out there in a timely manner. And you may need to have the equipment set and ready to go so that when the weather window presents itself, there's nothing in your way. But if that's the only pillar upon which you're building your weed control strategy, you're going to be disappointed when you have <coughs> Population shifts like we've seen with giant ragweed or new species like palmer amaranth moving into your area because they're going to give you challenges that that system that you're running with now probably can't handle. <laughs>